sodalities and modalities, church and parachurch, in relationship to each other in mission. The um, church, as I suggest, has six basic functions. Worship, logically and chronologically, belongs first. Because the church belongs to God, I think worship is its primary function. Second, evangelism, witness, worship, and then witness. Discipleship, third part, is the building up of the body, the whole educative ministry of the church. I put that third. I think logically that follows the evangelizing. The fourth is stewardship. Stewardship involves not just tithing and giving money, but stewards of all resources. If you are a president of a bank, it involves the stewardship of the bank's portfolio. If you are manager of a company, it is the steward of the resources of personnel and budget, funding, and time. Um, in a church, it is the stewards of stewardship of your whole life and time together as a people. For example, in my church, we discovered that the people didn't know how to shop. And they, they were wasting huge sums of money buying the wrong things. They'd buy Fritos and Pepsi, and they wouldn't get any vitamin C, iron, protein, or calcium in their body. And so one of our stewardship categories was to teach people how to buy and how to eat. And we would literally take them through the grocery stores and show them how to shop and a 303 can of vegetables versus another size and how much per ounce and so on you're paying. And then we had to deal with storage issues and how you cook things and, the, and how vegetables and fruits and things which in the inner city are very difficult and very costly. Uh, we, we discovered that little storefront grocery stores have a markup of up to about 40% above a jeweler and A&P, which is the hidden cost of credit. And most of those storefronts are illegal by health standards, and they're paying off somebody to stay open. And they pass that along to the poor people in terms of credit. So stewardship isn't only tithing. It's teaching people how to earn income, how to save it, how to spend it, and certainly how to give it. And so we had those four-pronged uh, aspects to funding. We had to teach people the value of money because most of them had never earned any. Um, so stewardship, I discover, is a large biblical category. It is a, a economia in the Bible. It's a huge word. It's a big concept. It involves stewards of lands and peoples and stewards of the earth. I am stewards of three children. That is, a steward is a manager. The children don't belong to me. My children do not belong to me. They have been loaned to me. I'm a steward, caretaker of the children. The one who owns them is the maker of heaven and earth. I don't own the house. Actually, the bank does. But even if I did, I don't own it. It's loaned to me. I'm a steward of a house. I'm a steward of an old car. I'm a steward of these things. Um, th it's a big word, and I think for, for the Christian, it's uh, one of the big four. Fifth, fellowship, koinonia. Um, this is a mandate for the church. It's not just uh, suppers and coffee clutches that we're talking about here. We're talking about community. We're talking about life-changing community, people who need who are hemorrhaging emotionally and needing the church as a support system. We're talking about those for whom church is family. The church is not the kingdom of God. The church is a sign and an agent of the kingdom. It's a, it's, it's a witness that the kingdom is there. The, the church is modeling the values of the kingdom. And in the kingdom, there's no differentiation between rich and poor, white and black, and all those things. So in the church, in the fellowship of the church, we try to model that. We model that. We lift it up. We, we create the concept that, the, that creates wonderment in the neighborhood. The people see gang people from different racial groups coming out of the church saying, my, how they love each other, right? It's an old acts phenomenon 
that once they heard the gospel, they got together and ate together and celebrated. The community meal is part of our life together. And then diaconia service is the sixth function of the church. And that takes many forms. Do good to all, especially the household of faith. It involves, I mean, when I went to call on families and I saw cribs pushed up against the wall where paint was peeling. And in old buildings in Chicago, any paint before 1940 had lead in it, which meant that the children play with that and they chew it and their brains go dead. Obviously, to be a steward of those kids means you have to take landlord to court because if you can't get the landlord, this is a just war theory, by the way. This is how I practice just war. You do everything you can privately to make landlords uh, take care of their buildings, but if they don't, you, you leverage the law against them. Um, one of my pastor friends went to court one day and kept watching poor people get thrown out of court. And he finally said to the uh, judge, Your Honor, if it please the court, could I ask a question? The judge said very sternly, Yes, Reverend, what is it? He said, Your Honor, where is the justice in this court? I've been watching the poor people thrown out of this court all morning long, including my uh, parishioner. Where is the justice in this court? And the judge said, This is not a court of justice. This is a court of law. If you want justice, change the law. See, I've never heard it more powerfully said why the Christian cannot just minister to the brain-damaged baby. You've got to go, if you believe the gospel, and leverage the just law in such a way that that prevention cycle can happen, you see? It's not enough just to move your family into a safe building and allow your neighbor whom you drive by. This is the, a modern version of the Samaritan story that you will commute by people whose babies are eating paint off walls so that your kid's in a good neighborhood and a good school, that's a pass buying on the other side that's totally unacceptable to me. So service, diaconia, involves all of those things. Once, uh, I had a meeting here at the Graham Center a number of years ago, and uh, a group of us with Leighton Ford and some of the college officials were sitting around the table along with a few of my colleagues from the city that had been invited to counsel Wheaton College on what could Wheaton College do about the city, particularly the Graham Center. My friends and I said, tried to tell them in kind ways that first of all they had to understand that they were part of the problem. You must understand that you're part of the white flight and white fright and first of all you need to repent. Secondly, you need to come humbly to find out the fact back into the city, not to do anything, but to, but to discover that when you left the city, the spirit didn't leave. The spirit stayed there and is working in all sorts of wineskins, white, black, brown, and yellow. And your first task after repenting is to come and acknowledge that and celebrate that and join that what's there. And, and you know, we, we, we got involved in all sorts of things. I would say that to you to navigators. Your first task isn't going to plan a ministry in the city. It's to go in and discover what's there and, and, and join it and, uh, and serve. And then God will give you gifts and open doors where you can lead the ministry into unreached peopleness and you can build up the body. But to just go in and build a ministry without networking and serving, I think, is very arrogant and imperialistic. Anyway, then after a lot of conversation, one layman in the group, a good friend, said, Ray, I get very excited when you and Bill Leslie from LaSalle Street Church and others talk about evangelism in the city. I get very nervous when you talk about social ministry, and social action, social justice. Isn't that the social gospel, he said. And I thought about that, and I could feel my blood pressure rising. <laughs> <laughs> I really... I think, uh, prayed and, um, and then said, I asked him, where do you live? He told me what suburb he lived in. And I said, why do you live there? <clears throat> he thought for a moment. He said, it's a very nice neighborhood. 
It's good for my family, good schools, safe, it's clean, it's quiet. It's a good housing value. Isn't that good stewardship? Well, I let him talk. Every reason he gave me for where he lives is a social reason. Good schools, clean air, clean streets, safe, good housing. Every reason that he lives where he lives is a social reason. So finally I said to him, you know, every reason you give for living where you live is a social reason. If anybody believes the social gospel, it's you. You've committed your whole life and your family to it. I said, but I want you to know we agree. He blinked. I said, yes, we agree. How could it possibly be wrong for me to be working on those agendas in my community when you already enjoy them in your community? So for example, when the police don't police and the streets aren't safe and the schools don't teach and you know all these things don't happen, I said, don't I have the same obligation as you to provide those for my children? In other words, don't I have an obligation to make my community what your community already is? And I said, I will believe you, frankly, when, it, when you tell me that we should just preach the gospel and that those things aren't important, I said, I, I think that's hypocrisy. I will only believe you when you leave your community and bring your family and live like me. Then I think you will change your tune. And it was a very interesting discussion, very interesting discussion, because I think that is a hypocrisy. I, I know a lot of people at Trinity and Wheaton over the years, and Moody, and they live out here and they have their kids in all these wonderful schools. And then they tell us in the city, just preach the gospel, don't do this social stuff. While they are out here where all the social systems are functioning for them. Uh, that's really hypocritical, really hypocritical. To, to go to the third world and say, now, don't you care about health care and things like that? You just preach the gospel to tell the church in South America or South Africa they shouldn't be concerned about justice when they wouldn't tolerate injustice for a minute. That's hypocrisy. So basically, I think the church has those six basic functions. Worship, evangelism, discipleship, stewardship, fellowship, and service. Now, what we must do is contextualize all those functions so that I must distinguish between the forms and the functions of the church. The function of evangelism is always the same. It's always adoration and praise of God. Homage, proskuneo. It's always bowing the knee in praise and honor to God. How I do it, the form in which my worship takes, whether I kneel, sit on the floor, do it at midnight or midday, or with music or without, or how we do it, the, fo the forms adapt to the context. The function is always the praise of God. How we do evangelism will surely vary. That we do it is not something we can ever get rid of. So one of the things we must do is, is learn to contextualize all six functions. If the people know how to eat and buy and are stewards of their money and time and everything, then you don't have to do what we did. Stewardship function is the same, but the forms need to change. What might require me to use a gospel choir to communicate in my community might require you to use a Madrigal Motet group in your community, see? And we're free to do that. We're free because the function is worship the forms must change. The problem is pastors sometimes don't know the difference and they have one form and, and they say that's the only way it can be done. Now, let me get to parachurch. A parachurch then is an organization that is gifted and called and specialized to do one of those six. A parachurch is gifted or called to enable the church to be an arm of the church and can specialize. It has the gift of specialization so that there are some parachurch ministries that are helping the church do creative worship. They're producing bulletins, they're, um, they're doing all sorts of things, musically and writing hymn books. And so Hope Publishing Company is helping us do worship. That Hope Publishing is a parachurch ministry. Uh, 
okay? Um, evangelism. There are all sorts of groups, from the Billy Graham Association to you name it, helping the church do evangelism. There are all sorts of groups helping people do discipleship, stewardship, fellowship, and service, you see? But parachurch has a gift of specialization, and that's, that's the only way I distinguish them. Parachurch also, in most cases, are lay ministry. That just happens to be a pragmatic fact, not a necessity, but often it's true. But the church is, basic, is often professional ministry in the sense of full-time uh, ordained leadership, and, and the parachurch is often, though not always, uh, lay ministry directed, the work of laity. So these are some of the distinctions I would make. Any other comments or questions about history? Could you just comment briefly uh, related to monasticism, when the female monasticism movement started, the nuns and all that, is that just parallel at the same time? Almost parallel at the same time. Yeah, not as, uh, not as uh, much, but there were nuns um, and convents that emerged right along with the abbot and the uh, the brothers. But I would say more and that accelerated later on. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux used to be an itinerant preacher to convents of women. And uh, he had 83 sermons I read that he preached on the Song of Solomon. And he used to love preaching them to these sex-starved, isolated convents. And one description <laughs> One of the more colorful aspects of uh, Bernard of Clairvaux's um, ministry was he would go into these convents and, and quote, let me kiss him with the kisses of his mouth for his love is better than wine. And the author says you could hear the gasps from the balcony <laughs> of these people who were panting for affection and had never received it. <laughs> That's probably the wrong text to use in a convent, but. <laughs> I don't know why I even said this, but uh, <laughs> yes, there were, there were uh, ministries like that, sure. You, you know, in the radical reformation that followed Luther, there was a, a group that went over to a city called Münster, and they created what they were going to call the apostolic community. And they decided after a while, uh, one of their leaders was King John of Leiden, it's in a low country of Deutschland. Um, and they decided to have an ordination service and use the pattern of Isaiah 6. So they got the live coals from the fire. You know, they were going to touch the lips of the, uh, of the ordained candidates so that they would speak the truth. <laughs> One writer said, Jeffrey Bromley at Fuller tells this story. He says, rather than cry, holy, 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 they couldn't spit for three weeks. <laughs> there have been all, all sorts of wonderful <laughs> experiences at trying to live out the apostolic pattern. And some of them have been successful, and some <laughs> of them have not. <laughs> yes? That's a different kind of question. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I was wondering if you could, from your knowledge of history and stuff, uh, speak to water baptism and how it was viewed in the early church and kind of maybe how it got all messed up mm -hmm. and where it stands today mm -hmm. with disciples of Christ today. Yeah. Okay. The question is about water baptism, its history and something about where it stands today. Um, asking a Baptist about water <laughs> baptism is an open door, and I will try not to take advantage of it. Uh, actually, the use of water as an initiation rite goes back far before the New Testament, as you may know, the Jewish uh, washings even go way back in proselyte, you know, you, baptism. You could become a Jew and you'd go through certain washings and rituals. And of course, the Islamic tradition has their own view of it. So in, in the Middle East, where water is precious, water was often viewed as a covenant sign in which you would symbolize your oath by making a water, uh, either washing or immersion. The Didache, which I had a copy of yesterday in the book I brought, um, has mention of 
baptism and suggests that the best model of it, following Jesus who was baptized in a river, is to have living water. The best baptism is living water. By living, they mean running water. Uh, they mean an outdoor creek or river that would be like the Jordan Valley. But being pragmatic, this is early in the second century, they admitted that if you couldn't have living water, a lake. And if you couldn't have a lake, uh, a container. And if you didn't have a lot, a little. It was very interesting to see the early church sort of working through that pattern. Uh, these were desert people, and some people lived far from any water. And the whole idea of an oasis uh, is that you probably can't do immersions in the Middle East uh, very well uh, with water pots and things. So the, I think the early church was very practical on this and did a combination of, of um, in terms of the amount of water used and the kind of water in indoor and outdoor. Almost um, in the second or third century, it became quite common to baptize people around Easter time after a long period of training. The so-called catechumens would be trained in Advent. Is Easter was the first Christian festival, and Christmas came in much later. Easter was early, and Easter seemed to be a wonderful time to celebrate the resurrection by baptizing new people, symbolizing death to the old and abundant life emerging from the water. And so the Easter cycle of preparation for baptism and the discipline of following Christ and then baptizing them on Easter in white robes, symbolic of new life, drawing the white robes from Revelation, uh, making use of the water images of the Bible, all that started to emerge fairly early in the church. All through the Middle East, you will find baptistries. I think what it means is that the normal way to baptize in the earliest church was immersion and with uh, quite a bit of water. Um, I've, been in, I've seen baptistries in ancient churches in Syria and Cyprus and Greek island churches and just in Paros, uh, the name of the ship that was blasted away a couple days ago. Uh, Paros Island I've been to and there's a marvelous old church with a baptistry, a walk-in baptistry. You go down the steps into it uh, on that island. So it, it seems fairly clear that the earliest church had baptistries where they didn't have access to river or living water. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, baptism was a time when they added confession in the baptistry. And after the baptism of Clovis, in which some 3,000 troops sort of marched through the puddle while the bishop <coughs> pronounced the benediction over them and they were baptized, 3,000 people in 496 in a mass baptism, um, some things began to change in baptism. Uh, for example, baptism was tied to confession and public confession, which is called auricular confession. And candidates used to stand in the baptistry to, and they would have to confess their sins and they would be baptized and raised. Well, um, <laughs> guess what would happen? Sometimes these people would confess that they had had sexual promiscuity with, and they'd point out the people in the church, oh. or that they had cheated and lied and stolen, but God forgave me and I'm asking you to forgive me. And occasionally a spear would come hurtling through the air <laughs> And the guy never lived long enough to get under the water. They, there were so many people who were killed in baptistries after they made their public confessions that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that for very good reasons, the Catholic Church adopted private confessionals. Now, maybe you didn't know this is why they did it. <laughs> Hey, you know, it's a good idea. I mean, we're building up the body of Christ, right? We want the people to confess their sins, without which, Romans 10, 9, you can't achieve salvation. But people began to realize that the practical realities were that you're likely to get killed before you get baptized. And you go to hell straight in the middle of your uh, <laughs> confession. 
Um, <laughs> and, and besides, blood all over the church is not cool, you know. But that was actually happening. There were people would be executed as soon as they got outside the church, if not inside. So auricular confession became a private confession. The priests set up confessionals there, and you could go confess privately. And the priest then would be be the mediator between God and the person. I think you can understand how that would happen. Just somebody got a brighter idea, said, "Hey, gee, you know, we're losing too many of our candidates." <laughs> So they, they come up with this idea. Now, along with this came, of course, I think, parallel, similarly, in other parts of the church, came the idea of baptizing children. And of course, the Philippian jailer text was one, but there was also, along with that, something that Calvin really, really affirms in the Presbyterian tradition, namely that baptism became identified with circumcision and became the New Testament rite of covenant and therefore, the children of believing parents could baptize their babies. Now, I should tell you that usually meant immersion in the earliest uh, cases. In fact, Luther, in his uh, small catechism, which was for the younger people, uh, the catechism which I studied as a kid, um, has this footnote. It's an Augsburg catechism published in Minneapolis, and it, it, it has a foot, this wonderful footnote. It says, Dr. Luther understands that the baptism of children means immersion of children. However, since most of our churches are unheated and in northern climates, it has been found unwise to do this. So the Lutheran church went to um, bab, you know, sprinkling as an expediency because m many of their churches are in the Arctic Circle um, and North Germany and tough winters. Luther had a different view of baptism than Calvin. Calvin viewed it as a sign of the covenant. Calvin took the Old Testament very literal. Luther believed the baby was the perfect candidate for salvation. You know why? Because a baby couldn't possibly do anything to earn salvation. The baby is helpless. The baby is just a bundle of faith. That's all a baby is, is a faith bundle. So from Luther's point of view, you can stick that bundle under the water, and that's baptism. And a grace will be mediated to that child, which will be confirmed later on. Yeah. It doesn't convert. It brings grace, grace mediated. But the, there is some argument about whether that converts or just how that relates in Lutheranism. But basically, the understanding is that confirmation is the seal that the baptismal vow was valid. And that brought godparents in. The Reformed Church then and the Lutherans would bring spiritual parents to surround the <coughs> biological parents who would be symbolic of the community that is going to support this child and nurture this child in the faith. So baptism then involved community and family and all of this. Um, in January 21st, 1525, George Blaurock, which in German means blue coat, um, and a group of Zwingli's disciples. I say January 21 because if you've been to Switzerland, you know that's the middle of the winter. They chopped a hole in the ice, and eight of these dudes baptized each other in the icy waters of, of the lake outside Zurich, in Zurich. And believer's baptism, which had been lost, adult believer's baptism, was brought back into the church by the Anabaptist movement. They're called Anna, which is the Greek word for over again or again and they were nicknamed the over again baptizers. As soon as they were baptized, most of them were imprisoned and drowned. They would tie rocks to them and drop them in the lake. Um, say, oh, you want to be baptized? Okay, we'll show you. And they, the bones of many of these Anabaptists are still on the bottoms of Swiss lakes. Um, they paid the price for, for the repudiation of 
infant baptism. They would be quizzed, and people say, well, have you not been baptized? No. Well, weren't you baptized as a child? Well, that's not baptism. See? And so they denied that they were rebaptized. They denied that was valid baptism. But the argument persisted, and many of them died. Baptism is a, a large issue. It always intrigued me that the Baptist churches would take water so literally, but not pay much attention to the, the wine, <coughs> and would not take it literally at all. Very often, take it symbolically, take it as a memorial. And I really think that Baptist churches have an integrity problem. If I think we ought to take water literally, but I think we also ought to take that wine and bread literally. I prefer to use Middle East bread, pita bread. The body of Christ was real. So, and when I go to communion, I want bread that takes a while to chew. I want it, you know, like, like the bread you buy on the streets in Jerusalem, which is probably what they ate in the upper room. And I say, this wafer bit, you know, this, this little melt in your mouth, tastelessness, that's doceticism for me. That's, that's the body of Christ. It's like a ghost. It melts in your mouth. It's not real. It's not real bread. So I want this tough Jerusalem Arab bread at my communions, or uh, baked bread. I love coming into a sanctuary where they've baked the communion bread in the oven at the church before, and you smell it, and you can hardly wait to get to communion to get that good bread. And you break off chunks of it, and you serve each other chunks of bread, and real wine, real fruit of the grape. Um, now, it's interesting. I think that's very consistent with real water. And I don't have symbolic water. <laughs> Stand in front of a picture and say, this? <laughs> Would you bow your head and go down? <laughs> uh, so I, you know, for me, the worship should have integrity and it should have real water. And yet, yes? I think one of the questions when did baptism start getting linked to salvation? In the uh, penitential system as it emerged in the third and fourth centuries, baptism increasingly began to be tied not only to the needs of babies, lest they go to hell or someplace unbaptized, but I think basically uh, as the penitential system which emerged in Catholic theology namely that in, in the Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, that man is sick and that the communion or baptism is the way you deal with the primary sickness. You, you, you deal with the disease by baptism. Sins, that's prevenient. Sins that you commit after you're baptized are dealt with by the sacrament of confession. So. Baptism takes care of the sin that you inherited and that you may have committed up to the time of your baptism. And as the church began to work this out, it was during the time of the martyrs when a lot of them were dying. I mean, the adults were dying and so on. And so it became very important to really to baptize the children so that the children would, would know that they had a Christian upbringing. And then, of course, as Muslims came along, uh, I think it was very important for Christians to baptize the children so that the children would know they were not Muslims and the Muslims would know they were Christians. That somehow um, in the Middle East there was an accommodation between these religious groups that once you'd had your bar mitzvah at age 12 or once you were baptized or once you were, you know, initiated in the rites of Islam, they pretty much left you alone or else occasionally forced you to convert by the use of the sword if they were powerful enough. So I think it was mostly pastoral reasons why this happened uh, over a period of a long time that uh, baptism began to take on this, uh, this role. Any other historical reflections on yesterday or questions? Is it the same lines about when did conversion with no baptism appear? I mean, I, I know people who say, I'm not, I haven't, I'm not getting baptized. Yeah. When did conversion with no baptism appear? I would have to say that's really a modern uh, uh, phenomenon. 
that would certainly be uh, probably after the 19th century, okay. the last hundred years. Baptism, I mean, uh, uh, Christians who actually don't believe in baptism at all. Um, and that, um, that would be within the history, say, of probably 1800s to the present. They're like, for instance, Luther didn't believe that he had to be baptized to be saved. No, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but you, your baptism is, is grace. And as Christian, Luther, I, this is my Luther lecture here. Luther, uh, <laughs> Luther had a view of the law and grace. It was very uniquely Lutheran. And that is that the law condemns you. That's what his purpose is. You should preach the law to little kids because the law will condemn them and it will drive them to the cross where they will confess Christ. Once they have confessed Christ and received the gospel into their life, they are saved by faith in the grace created by the works of Christ. Hey, it's too simple to say we're saved by faith, not by works. You must understand that that's a little bit truncated. We are saved by faith in the works of Christ. So don't forget there are works. Luther would argue then, once I have received the grace of God upon my confession, symbolized in baptism, I then am driven back to the commandments, not because I have to obey them, but because I will want to. The, the, command, the second use of the commandment then is for sanctification. The third use of the law is a public use of the law to restrain evil. Luther and Calvin both had three uses of the law, one of which was the sanctifying. Uh, there's no legalism on this in Luther, no legalism at all. You're, you're driven to the cross, you receive the grace of Christ, then you go back to the commandments, but not because you're obligated, but because the Spirit makes you want to obey the law. You don't do it to earn salvation, but because you've already received it, you do it as a sign that you have received it. So quite a different post-conversion approach to law. Law and grace is, is very much at the center of Luther's salvation theology. Question? Different question. Okay. Uh, you know, if we look at history, we can see uh, the influence of the Roman Catholic Church and so forth. And yesterday we spent time talking about Mary. And of course, Chicago is uh, primarily a Catholic yes. town here. Uh, when ministering to Roman Catholics, how do you deal with the doctrinal error you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, that we see? And, and uh, once you try to, uh, I know, like, for example, yeah. we're, we, we're involved in Baptist Church, and uh, it's amazing. Let's say over half of our church are people who have come out of the Catholic Church. Yes. You know, is that. Is that the right thing to do, to try to bring people into the Baptist church or mm. the other church? Or is mm -hmm. there's another approach, like you said yesterday, to try to renew, you know, the, uh, yes. to the Catholic church? And if you do that, then how do we deal, how do you personally deal with the doctrinal error? Right. I'll repeat a little of that for the sake of the camera. The, the um, question about how we deal with the Catholic church, do we encourage them to come out of the church and join our church? or? This, how do we work with that or relate to it? Let me say that Donald McGavran, who is a missiologist out at Fuller, founder of the School of World Mission, was asked a question I think similar, and I remember his response, and I'll use it here because I think it, it applies. He was being asked, what do we do with these um, tribal conversions in Africa where the gospel sort of gets all tangled up in tribalisms and even some heresies. You know there are many such groups that have come to Christ, whole tribes, and it's sort of a mixture of tribal folkway and the gospel on a continuum. Some are more tribal than gospel, some are more gospel than tribal, but there's a whole range of them. There are some, several thousands of these groups that have been studied. We know about them. And McGavern's approach is this. What he said was, 
um, keep them in the tribe. Don't destroy the tribe or yank people out of their tribe because they'll fall ill to other diseases. He said, the best strategy is to promote within them a high view of Scripture. Promote a high view of Scripture. Get him involved in the Bible. And he said this, in two or three generations, they will self-correct. Which is, they will either leave the church on their own or they will reform it in the process. I like that. And I would apply it in this case to Roman Catholics or groups that may be in a church uh, that is quite different from mine. And I would just say, promote a high view of Scripture and then encourage them to follow their conscience. But I would never put down their church. I would not. That's, I make it very clear. When, when I network and I go into a neighborhood and I visit the Catholic priests, I invite them to my church so I can introduce them. I thank them publicly for serving God in the neighborhood, as I do the Pentecost and the Methodists and the, you know, everybody in my neighborhood. I go visit them. I tell them all, I'm not here to make Baptists out of you or your people. I'm here because I want to reach unreached people that no church is reaching. And by any measure, probably 60% of the neighborhood's unreached. And I think this is the, by any church uh, in any state in this country, virtually. So I think that's my response to that is I have a high view of the Spirit, I have a high view of the Scripture, and I say, let's get him into Bible study, and let's just let the Spirit work it out. Mm -hmm. It's almost time for our break. Why don't we take it just a few minutes early, and then I'll come back. No, I'll tell you what. I, I found a way, I think, to get us into this. Uh, if you don't have your manuscript, would you get it during break? Because I want to work through some pages of it uh, on the Luther section in the second volume. So if you will, um, if you will, get that manuscript before you come back. Let's let's go ahead and take the remaining 15 minutes. Let me put a paradigm on the board, um, asking the question. How does reform come? How do you renew a church? Everybody knew in the 16th century that the Catholic Church was sick. It had divided. It was, uh, there were two popes at one time, even three, one in Avignon. There were abuses, simony, the buying and selling of offices. There were incredible problems in church. Everyone knew that. The, the Renaissance papacy was unbelievably corrupt, just unbelievably. If you want to read the secular side of this, read Irving Stone's Agony and the Ecstasy, which is a biography of Michelangelo, who was getting paid by these various popes to build St. Peter's and design the dome, which he did. And he, his cousin, Guglio, happened to be Pope Alexander VI. And uh, there's marvelous pictures of the Renaissance papacy in this otherwise interesting historical novel by Stone called The Agony and the Ecstasy. But there are other ways to get at this material, too. The, the papacy was sick. The Catholic Church was in trouble. Uh, the governments were, were impinging on the church. The popes got in, torn. They had no power. They had no armies anymore. They were really really uh, political football in some ways, uh, to the Habsburgs, Hohenzollerns, uh, Francis of France, and certainly Charles V of Spain. Um, the question is, how would the reform of the church come? And there were really five basic responses to this question. The first response, not necessarily in um, logical and chronological, was the response of Savonarola, who said, evangelism is the way reform will come. In fact, mass evangelism. The assumptions of mass evangelism are that you convert one at a time, one by one, multiplied times the many, 
And the result will be reform in the church and renewal of society. A modern practitioner of Savonarola would be Billy Graham. Yeah. You're right. And Bill Bright. And probably uh, this organization, possibly. There was a second response. Savannarola was a Florentine evangelist, by the way, who died. Um, he was put <laughs> at fireside service. He was burned, actually, 1496. Uh, <laughs> he didn't really have as much time to work out his theory as we could have wished. But this has always been, uh, here was a Catholic evangelist preaching to the masses, uh, but he never really had a full chance like Billy to work out all the details of his uh, theory. But the assumption, again, the assumption of this model is that, the primary assumption is that, that the conversion of people, individuals, multiplied by the masses will bring about the reform of the church and renewal of society. Erasmus had a different solution. Erasmus of Rotterdam was a brilliant, brilliant humanist. He wrote Encridian, which literally means on the Christian soldier. He wrote In Praise of Folly, which is one of my favorite books, which is a sort of uh, uh, Art Buckwald of the late Middle Ages. He just pokes fun at the church and, and laughs at its abuses. It's like uh, Boccaccio's Decameron, which is another book, maybe even more my favorite. It, I love this sort of Monty Python humor that comes out of the, these, these people. It's, the French called it a chanson de geste. It was, it was a kind of humor where they just mock the church. They just laugh at it. They tell the priests are always the brunt of every joke. <laughs> And, you know, here's a story from Boccaccio. Guy goes off to, to Rome. Uh, before he goes, he's a member of this little dirty storytelling group that sit around and tell dirty stories all the time. The, the biggest dirty storyteller is the priest, of course. In the group, there is this sincere Catholic layman who finally says, you know, I've been struggling with my life. I, I think I should become a Christian. And the priest says, good God, what for? He said, well, I'm concerned about my soul. He said, well, you know, he, the priest did everything he could to talk him out of it. He, and finally he said, well, what would you do? How would you decide? He said, well, I think I would go to Rome. I will see this, the holy city of Peter and Paul. Then I will know whether I should become a Christian. By this time, the priest saw the guy was really dead serious, so he tried to stop him because he knew Rome was just reeking in corruption. He says, for God's sake, don't go to Rome, anything but Rome. The priest said, no, I must go to Rome. So he goes to Rome. Six months later, he comes back to the group, and the priest and everybody said, well, what happened? What happened? Man, what happened? You know, he says, well, he said, I have not only decided to become a Christian, I've decided to become a monk of the church. The priest said, good God. How did it happen? Why? He said, I went to Rome and saw all that corruption and said to myself, anything that can survive all this corruption must be of God. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the kind of humor that Erasmus and Boccaccio were, were laying out. I mean, it was like a series of these. You know, they, they draw cartoons of this, this, this uh, peasant, this shriveled up peasant on a little donkey going through the streets. And they'd have a dialogue, first peasant, second peasant. First peasant, who is that lowly, humble man? Second peasant, why, that is our holy, lowly Lord Jesus Christ. Next scene, there's this splendid white horse stallion and this rider with all these rings and glitter and gold and dross and followed by pomp and everything else. First peasant. Who is this man who rides like a Turkish uh, warrior through our streets? Second peasant. Oh, that is the earthly follower, of, leader of the man on the donkey. <laughs> or the earthly representative of the man on the donkey. Now, th that kind of stuff was the 
stuff of the chanson de geste. They were just mocking the church. Erasmus translated the Bible. He produced a Greek testament. He went back and dug up research. His whole idea back to the fountain. Get, let's get back to the original manuscripts. The problem Erasmus was realizing was that the church was in trouble because it was so ignorant, absolutely ignorant. Priests didn't know that many had been ordained had never seen a Bible, never seen one. There were whole churches that had never seen a Bible, anybody in a church. A few, they had chained the Bible to a pulpit. It was the only Bible anybody could see. Uh, the Bible was just unavailable for people. And so Erasmus, in 1516, produced his own text. He went out, Doug, he did it, an absolutely phenomenal job of producing a Greek Testament. And remember, printing had just been invented. Movable type, 1453, Gutenberg. And so Erasmus, one of the first copies of came off the press were these Greek Bibles and, and other Bibles from Gutenberg's press. Also, 1453, Constantinople fell, and a lot of new Greek scholars fled to the West to get away from Turks. And so Greek Platonic academies, the Renaissance, remember, was the recovery of, of the sort of secular Greek culture. The Reformation benefited from the Renaissance. Erasmus was a Renaissance humanist, and his approach was through education. If we have better education for the clergy, <coughs> then reform will come. The assumption here is that knowledge will lead to behavioral reform. If you believe that, um, it, you're sort of in the category of the Surgeon General warning. Um, <laughs> what you're about to smoke is going to take your life and see how many people actually stop just because they know that. I think knowledge does, in fact, impact. Um, if this is the Billy Graham model, who is in Model 2? Who are the Erasmians today? Seminaries. Seminaries. That's right. I'll put my seminary, Dallas, yeah, seminaries. <laughs> but Dallas and Trinity, Westminster, all those classically oriented. Let's get people back, require Greek and Hebrew, uh, get people back to the fountain it would be that model. If we can get the pulpit preaching the word again, the people will believe and reform will come. There's a third group of people called conciliaris. There were a lot of people in this category. Jean Gerson, G-E-R-S-O-N, uh, uh, Père Dailly, D-A-I-L-L-Y, um, uh, Henry of Langenstein, etc. Uh, these are some of my favorite people. Their assumption was the church is just badly organized. Uh, we've got three popes. That's a bad scene. We've got two cardinals. We've got people in the curia who should never be there. We've got bad structures. Our committees don't function well. We've got too many ignorant people running the show. What we need to do is bring about reform of the structures. And, and the way we'll do it is the same way we'll cure a Watergate presidency. We'll let Congress do it. And Congress will take care of it. <laughs> right? Now, this tends to assume that depravity exists in every organization and that what you need to do is spread it out. <laughs> if, it, if it gets too concentrated, you know, manure is great it's, if it's spread out. If it's in a pile, it's not good at all. And the assumption is that, you know, every organization is sinful. We just got to have check and balance system. We, we just got to spread the manure out. And if we do that, reform will come. Who would be in this model today? <laughs> Who? <laughs> yeah, there are ecumenical groups. 
Um, I think uh, the McCormick DMIN model, Doctor of Ministry programs generally work here um, because they generally teach pastors how to restructure. How about uh, leadership organizational development conferences? Um, Fuller is starting a new school of administration. Uh, people who are promoting better methods. Ted Engstrom. Drucker. Drucker. Yeah, this is sort of in the Drucker mode. Um, Engstrom and, and uh, Ed Dayton, my friends at World Vision. These are the people who are the systems analysts. And they say, look, uh, even the best people get killed by bad structures. The fourth model is state-sponsored reform. Uh, it had two forms in the Reformation, at least. One was in England, and one was in Spain. In England, it was Henry VIII, and in Spain, Cardinal Jimenez. In England, Henry said, let Parliament reform the church. Let Parliament do it. And Jimenez said, let the Inquisition do it. The assumption in both cases is the church is incapable by itself of bringing about reform. The church can't do it alone. It needs government help. Like prayer and school amendments. Like and who, who would this be today? Falwell. Yeah, basically Falwell. Uh, in fact, let me go so far as to say both the left and the right would argue this. Far left, far right. But the ideological right wing has done a conversion on this the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, and, and really, the assumption is let's take over the government and make it work for the church. Now there's a fifth model, and that is leave the church, <laughs> create the alternative, and the assumption is <laughs> the church is incapable. The church is incapable of reform. The old models of this were Anabaptists, primarily, and many of their ilk. And who today would be in this category? Navigators. Navigators? <laughs> 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 OK, there are all sorts of independent. Now, where would you put Luther and Calvin? Put them here? No? Two or five. Two or five? Four. Four? It kind of evolved. Kind of? They took different ones. OK. I think so. These were the original ones, right? There's some yeah, now. yeah. These are 16th century models of reform. There was one that was even predating this, which was in a, in this category, sort of. It's the mystical interior reform. Um, and there was a whole tradition of Catholic spirituality that just you you, you just accept it, and you interiorize the spirituality. But I really don't consider that a model of reform of the church. It's a reform of persons, and let the church go to hell. Uh, it's going to go to hell anyway. It's just part of the evil world. So there was an interior spirituality tradition which uh, comes out in John and Mother uh, Teresa and many of the um, Catholic mystics. But I, I don't include that tradition as a reform model particularly. But these were actually looking at external structures of the church. Now here's what I would suggest to you. Luther and Calvin 
did all five. And I would like to argue, therefore, that there's no one way by itself to reform a church. Okay? There's no one way to reform a church. In the 16th century or today, evangelism will not do it by itself. Seminaries and education won't do it by itself. Restructuring won't do it. Government agencies can't help us do the job totally. And alternative structures aren't the solution either, uh, totally. A little truth in all, lots of truth in all, probably. But I would argue that in my city, I see all five models, just like you've identified. And I, I, acceler I um, celebrate that. I see signs and models of renewal in many churches today. My own denomination, which is off many of your maps so far, um, probably more heretical in some parts of my denomination than the Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation. I think we've got quite a few Unitarian types in my, or Binitarians at least, uh, if there is such a thing. Um, practical Binitarians or Unitarians. But it's my family, and I don't chuck the family just because I don't agree with it. But, you know, the most interesting thing is the family's coming back to um, a healthier view of the gospel. Really, ABC has really reformed. And it's because we have a new evangelism department, we have new leadership, we have different structures. I think some of our seminaries are starting to bite the bullet and get back on board, and et cetera. And then we have a whole bunch of independent groups impacting and playing around the edges of our organization. So I think uh, a lot of that is happening. Um, but I think this is where the history can help us, you see? Because I don't think any one organization today is the ultimate answer. I really think it's, reform is so complex, the whole issue of reform, that it takes all of these. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of reform, or how do you define reform? Uh, oh, to, to get back to faithfulness to the gospel and back to the basics, back to the grace and faith and salvation and, and the, you know, that stuff gets crusted over. I mean, people say it's important, but then they, their real energies are doing something else, building buildings instead of world mission, They're, you know, doing all sorts of stuff which may be good, but we sort of fall into this slowly. We, we don't usually get, you know, off the track quickly. It usually comes over a period of a long time. We play little games and accommodate the culture and so on and so forth. And, and, and so either you chuck the whole thing. See, Luther wasn't willing to do that. I must tell you, but let me wait till we get back to tell you Luther, how Luther stayed within the church until they threw him out. But how he then, even in the clothing that he wore, modeled the gospel. I think that's very important. Because Luther pastored poor people, and he said, if you just take all the statues out and all the robes off the preachers and everything, you're just kicking the crutches out from under sick people. Even if they are a crutch, you've got to keep them there until the people can walk. So Luther was not an iconoclast who was in there breaking down statues and ripping off vestments and wiping out monasteries. Luther wanted it to work more slowly because he was pastoring poor peasants, and he realized they needed more time. So he was, he was not the cutting edge radical that some would like to think. Whereas at Zwingli, uh, he was. He went out like a flamethrower. Uh, he was a great Swiss, but a lousy uh, reformer at certain levels. Um, well, let's take our break. Be sure you get your um, copy.